Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to talk about what's probably the most important and interesting part of chemistry, chemical reactions. In particular, I want to talk about how we can tell how fast or slow a chemical reaction is. That's especially important when we want to study things like combustion reactions, or develop new types of rocket fuel or longer lasting batteries. The study of the speed of a chemical reaction is called chemical kinetics, and there's a lot to learn about it, so we'll spend the next several videos talking about chemical kinetics. To begin, let's think about what's really happening when two chemicals react. Suppose we have this generic reaction, where two reactants, A and B, react to form a product molecule, C. Here's what this might look like at the very beginning, before any of the reactants have reacted together. In order for a reaction to occur, a red A molecule and a blue B molecule have to collide. And even if they do, not every collision will result in a reaction. But think about what will happen as the molecules react. At the beginning, A molecules and B molecules collide with each other very often, just as in this simulation. Let's say that's the situation at time zero. But as the reaction occurs, the amount of A and B molecules decreases, and the amount of C goes up. That means that collisions between A and B happen less often, and that means there aren't as many molecules reacting with each other. That tells us that the reaction slows down as time goes on. It starts out fast, but gets slower and slower as it gets harder and harder for the reactant molecules to find each other. This is true for almost every reaction. The rate of a reaction decreases with time unless we add more reactant to the container. Before we go on, let's try to nail down a good definition of the rate of a chemical reaction. When we talk about the speed of a car, we mean the distance it travels in a certain period of time. So, it's usually miles or kilometers per hour. When we talk about the speed of a chemical reaction, we can think about it the same way. Of course, unlike a car, we don't measure the distance we travel. Instead, one definition that seems natural is the amount of product that forms. For example, in the case of the generic reaction we saw a few minutes ago, we could define the reaction rate this way. The rate is delta C over delta T. You might remember that delta means change. The square brackets are a shorthand way of saying concentration, so the numerator here is the change in the concentration of C. Usually we measure that in units of molarity. The denominator is the change in time. So, just as we measure the speed of a car as a distance over time, we measure a reaction rate as molarity over time. But this is just one way of measuring the rate. Suppose C is a difficult compound to detect. In that case, we could measure the rate using one of the reactants instead. If we did that, we'd have one of these two equations. This time, we're using the concentration of A or B. Notice that there's one other important difference. The concentrations of the two reactants decrease, so delta A and delta B are negative numbers. But we still want the rate to be a positive number, so that's why these two fractions have a negative sign in front of them. So, we have three different equations for the rate. But there's an important problem with this definition of rate, which you might not have noticed. These three equations might give us three completely different values for the rate. Here's why. Suppose this was your reaction. Chlorine gas and fluorine gas react to form chlorine trifluoride. Based on what we said a few minutes ago, we could write three different expressions for the rate. If we do it for chlorine, we'll have this. Remember, we want a negative sign in front of the fraction because the chlorine is a reactant, which means its concentration will be decreasing we get a similar equation for the fluorine. Meanwhile, if we determine the rate using chlorine trifluoride, we get this equation. But think about the reaction for a minute. The coefficients tell us that one mole of chlorine reacts with three moles of fluorine. In the equations we've written, the concentration of fluorine will change three times faster than for chlorine. So, the rate with respect to fluorine will be three times faster than for chlorine. Meanwhile, the rate with respect to the chlorine trifluoride will be two times faster than for the chlorine. That tells us that the equations we've been using so far for the rate aren't quite right. We should get the same rate no matter which compound we choose. 
In this example, we would get the same result for the rates with respect to chlorine and fluorine if we divided our equation for fluorine by 3. In the same way, we'd get the same rate with respect to the chlorine trifluoride if we divided that equation by 2. That gives us a clue we need in order to come up with a better equation for the reaction rate. Suppose we had this generic reaction. We have some reactants called A and B, and some products called C and D. And the balanced reaction has coefficients, lower cases A, B, C, and D. Just like before, the rate of the reaction will be the change in concentration over the change in time, with negative signs in front for the reactants. But this time, we'll divide each one by the coefficient from the balanced reaction. If we do that, we'll get the same number no matter which compound we use to measure the rate. So now we have a much better way to calculate the rate of a reaction. But there's still a problem, and it's something we mentioned at the beginning of this video. Remember, we saw that when the reaction starts, collisions between the reactants happen very often, so the reaction rate is high, but it slows down as the number of reactant molecules decreases. That means the rate will be different depending on when we measure it during the reaction. For example, suppose we study this reaction. We have chlorobutane and water, and they react to form butanol and HCl. Suppose we measure the rate using the chlorobutane. The equation we want will be this one. Let's look at some real data and calculate the rate. Here's the concentration of chlorobutane at different times during the reaction. If we use the first two points, you can see that the concentration changes by 0.0095 molar, and the time changes by 50 seconds. That gives us a rate of 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4 molars per second. But suppose we use the second and third points instead. The change in concentration now is 0.0085 molar, and the change in time is 50 seconds. That gives us a rate of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 4 molars per second. That's different than what we got with the first two points. Remember, we said that the rate should decrease as the reaction happens, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. If we go ahead and calculate the rate for each pair of points, here's what we'll get. This shows us a weakness in our definition of the rate. It depends on what the concentration of the reactants is at the time we start measuring the rate. It turns out that what we're actually measuring when we use this formula is called the average rate. The average rate is useful, and we'll do some problems with it in class and on the homework, but you can tell that it'll be challenging to get consistent results for the rate using this method. How can we do better? As you can see in this reaction, the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration at the moment we start our measurement. It would be nice if we could figure out exactly how the concentration and the rate are connected. And in fact, we can do that. We can predict the rate from the concentration using what's called a rate law. And that's what we'll do in the next video. Rate laws are the most useful way of predicting the rate of a reaction, so we'll spend some time figuring out how to find them and use them. That'll allow us to predict all kinds of useful, practical things about chemical reactions and the amount of time they take. We'll get started on that in the next video, so I hope you'll join me for that one. Until then, have a good week.